Hi, welcome back. We are going to continue our discussion on consumer buying behavior by looking at the internal influences today. Last time we looked at the external influences being the situation and the social influences, but today we're going to see what goes on inside that head of yours that makes you do the things you do. As you can see by looking at this list, we have a number of areas we're going to look at. We're going to concentrate, though, on the first and the last one a little bit more. Those are the biggies, but especially the first one. Perception, as you probably know, is the way we organize and attach meaning to different stimuli. And people's perceptions change all the time. Two people are going to perceive things differently. It's a hard area for marketers to address. You know, if you think about a car accident, 10 witnesses, you're going to have 10 different versions of what happened, 10 different descriptions of the people involved. So if people interpret things so much differently, how are we supposed to come up with a campaign or a package or strategy that's going to have the same effect on most of the people in the target market? It is a real challenge that we need to address. And so we start out by looking at some of the sub-issues of perception. And so let's take a look at some of the types of things we look at. First of all is selective exposure. Your brain is exposed to millions of stimuli constantly. You have things coming to all of your different senses. When you're driving a car, you're viewing the landscape, the billboards, the cars around you, the street. You're looking for potholes. You see the birds. You see the possum trying to run across the street. You're hearing sirens and the radio and the news and your children in the back seat. You're hearing that thumping under your car and you're hoping that's not your tire rod or something. You smell something funny and you're hoping that's the truck next to you and not your car. You know, there's all sorts of stimuli coming on at one time. How does your brain know which ones to focus on? Because it cannot focus on all of them, even though every stimuli goes into your brain. Well, usually what we tend to do is focus on the things that stand out, that are different, that have an impact on us for one reason or another. If we were in a large lecture hall right now and somebody coughed, probably 99% of the people in the class would not be able to identify who that person was. And the reason is a cough is just a normal noise. The focus is on the lecture. The focus is on the education. The focus is on the topic. A normal noise, even though it goes into our brain, isn't going to really register. We're not going to give it our attention. However, if that person started choking, then everybody would focus on it because that's a sound we know is an emergency that needs our attention. So how does this relate to marketing? Well, let's go back to the idea of billboards. Isn't there some billboards that you see, that you notice, that you look at every time you go by? And then there's a lot of others that you couldn't even tell anybody what you saw even though you look at the same one every day. It's because there's something unique about that billboard that makes it stand out. To get that attention, to get the focus, it's very easy. You just need to be different. Of course, once you're different, then everybody's going to copy you and you won't be different anymore. But it's the ones that do stand out. The billboards that are three-dimensional usually get people's attention. The ones that have something very clever to say usually get and keep people's attention. The ones that revolve, that change, those get people's attention. So again, the impact of selective exposure is we want to do something different to stand out, to get that focus. The second type of perception we're going to look at is selective distortion. And this is a very hard one to lecture on because we all do this, but we're never aware that we do it. And we find it very hard to believe that we do it. Selective distortion is when information comes in our brain that doesn't fit what we know or what we believe. And so we change that new information. An example that is used, and I kind of have a hard time believing this, is that if you really enjoy your soft drink, I'm not going to say Coke addict again, but if you really enjoy your Pepsi and your favorite celebrity comes on a talk show and talks about how much they enjoy Coke, a cola, um, 
you're probably going to distort that in your head. You're not going to realize you're doing it, though. You're going to think they said they like Pepsi. I do have one example that actually happened to me, and it's very unique that you find out that this happened. I, for years, for years, thought Domino's started at Ohio, Domino's Pizza started at Ohio State University. I am a fan, a fanatic. I am in love with the Ohio State University, home of the Ohio State University Buckeyes. Well, somebody brought it to my attention that I was wrong. Domino's actually started at University of Michigan. If you know anything about college rivalries, this is not a good thing for a Buckeye to hear. I couldn't conceive that something good, Domino's, came out of that school. It was just inconceivable, so I changed it. Um, it wasn't until somebody actually showed me the facts that I realized that I was doing it. What does this mean for marketers? We have to test our messages. When we put out advertisements, we've got to make sure that the correct message is being received. Selective retention means people don't always remember what they've been exposed to. If you've ever taken a test, you've probably experienced this. You know you heard it, you know you know it, and you don't remember it. The marketing implications is repetition, which we're going to talk in more detail later. Repetition. The more you hear it, the more likely you are to remember it and retain it. Now, one area of perception that gets a lot of attention is subliminal perception. And this is when the stimuli that you're exposed to is so low in intensity that it's below your level of consciousness. You're not aware that you've been exposed to that stimuli. And there's some ethical concerns about that. You know, is it fair to give subliminal messages, to hide messages in music, to have what the classic study is, to have a, a frame of a soft drink inserted into a movie? A frame of film is actually on the screen for one thirty-second of a second, too fast for you to ever be aware that you saw it. However, they Coca-Cola did this experiment many, many years ago. They would take an icy cold glass of Coke with the words drink Coke and insert it in different places in a film. The result, people went crazy and just bought tons and tons and tons of Coca-Cola at this movie. So there was a big uproar about, we need to make it illegal, we need to get rid of it. The problem is, remember when we were talking about secondary research, you always want to verify how a study was done and get the details. The fact was, this study was done in a movie theater in hot weather, the air conditioning broke, and the sale of all drinks skyrocketed. There's never been conclusive proof, one way or the other, that subliminal messages have an effect. Um, ethically, I don't know that you need to use it. Some companies do. One example is relaxation tapes and CDs. They will usually, within the sounds of the ocean, you know, banging on the shore, whatever, they will insert some messages that say, relax, take a deep breath, calm down. Um, I don't feel that this is unethical because if you read the liner notes on the CD or the tape, whatever you're listening to, they usually tell you that those are inserted. So they're not trying to do anything unethical. They are just trying to help you relax. If it works, great. If it doesn't, no harm done. The last area of perception we're going to look at is something called just noticeable difference. And this is a really key issue in your marketing strategy. And I'm going to put up a graphic here. Um, you see these bars. Those are three different levels of stimuli intensity. This first one is below the level of consciousness. So that's what subliminal would be. Okay. Over here, this line is representing, it just has J there, but it's representing the J and D, the just noticeable difference point. It's totally above your area of consciousness, so you're aware this is going on. But what we're looking for is how much does a stimuli, say a price, have to change before your behavior changes. If you routinely buy a product that costs $5 and a competitive product goes on sale for $4.95, you're aware of that price savings of a nickel, but it's probably not enough to get you to switch from your brand. However, if it was $3 off, 
ooh, you might give that competitive brand a try. Somewhere in between there is your just noticeable difference point, the point where your behavior changes. So we can use this in our pricing strategies. We can use it in our packaging strategies. Do we change the package enough so that it attracts a new target market, it makes, gives it a new image? Or do we change it just a little so that it doesn't look out of date? We can use this concept in a lot of different contexts. But it's important to realize the JND, the Just Noticeable Difference, is fully ethical. It is way above your level of consciousness. You know that the change is happening. The question is, is it enough to change your behavior? Okay, so let's go back then to our list of internal influences. Motivation. We can look at your needs to see how they motivate the types of products that you may want or the brands that you may want. We can also look at what we call your patronage motivation. Why do you go to the stores you do? And many times that's a question of loyalty and it goes back to what we were talking about in the very first couple segments of this course. That we want to try and build a relationship with our target market, a loyalty, so that they will be motivated to keep coming back to our store. That's what we call patronage motivations. People's attitudes are important. Attitudes are the way they feel about our product or, or our company. It's not necessarily based in reality. It may not be based on fact. It's just their attitude towards it. And you, you know this. You know sometimes you wake up in the morning and you just have a bad attitude and you have no idea why. Just get out of my way and stay out of my way. Well, if you don't understand where your attitudes come from all the time, you can imagine how difficult it is for us to, to figure it out. We can change people's attitudes. If we find our target market has a negative attitude towards our company or towards our product, as long as there's not a quality issue or something at that point, we can change that attitude, but it's going to take a long time. It's very slow. It's going to be expensive as we do a lot of commercials trying to change our image, etc. That's what a lot of commercials on TV are trying to do, actually, is affect your attitude, your emotions, the way you feel about a product or company. Now, some marketers put a lot of emphasis on the next two areas, looking at personality and your lifestyle and or age groups. Um, and those are important. They do affect what you buy and why you buy. But particularly the age group and lifestyle, I think, have a little more impact. As you go through different life stages, you're looking and willing to spend money for different things. For example, when you're newlyweds, you're probably buying the cheapest product you can find. But once you get settled in your career, you're supporting your family, you're probably willing to spend more money on products, say furniture, but it's got to be a better quality. You're looking for something more durable. So that's kind of what we're talking about there. Now the last area, and I said I wanted to spend some time talking about it, is learning. Believe it or not, this is what marketing is really about. We have a message that we want to get across to our target market. We want them to learn it, to know it, to accept it. And so there's some different learning techniques that we do. One is repetition. Repetition is the key to learning. Let me repeat that. Repetition is the key to learning. The more you hear something, the more likely you are to internalize it, to accept it. And so that is an important concept to realize why we use slogans and why we try and get catchy ones and use them over and over and over again because we want people to internalize those. However, again, here's where research comes in, there's a point where that cute slogan that everybody likes that I've been hearing and they're internalizing becomes really obnoxious. And we never want to hear it again. So we've got to be measuring that carefully, and we've got to make sure that we stop before that point. We want people to hear our slogan years from now and remember what it is, even though they haven't heard it for years. Some examples. Pardon me, would you have any... I'm willing to say that you said Grey Poupon, but think about the last time you saw that commercial or heard that slogan. It's been a long time but they stopped it before it became obnoxious. People liked it, it was catchy, it had an effect. The second learning method is called operant conditioning. 
An operant conditioning is when you reward the desired behavior. Okay, you reward the desired behavior. For example, if you buy a box of cereal and you open up the box and inside's a coupon good on your next purchase, that's operant conditioning. The key here is that the behavior happens first, that desired behavior. And the examples we're talking about, we're talking about buying our product. So once you buy our product, then you get the reward. Frequent flyer miles is another example of operant conditioning. Now the last learning method, classical conditioning, comes from Pavlov's dog. If you're familiar with psychology, never studied, ever studied that. In this example, and I may get the details wrong, um, they would ring a bell and give the dog meat. Okay, ring the bell, give the dog meat, and they repeated that. It got to the point where they could ring a bell and the dog would start to salivate whether there was any food present or not. That's classical conditioning. We're attaching a, a product, an emotion, a reaction to a, a stimuli. Can that happen in marketing? I'm going to ring a bell and you're going to buy my product? Well, not that blatantly. But again, this is what most commercials do. What they're trying to do is attach an attitude or an emotion to their product or company. So you see a commercial you like, you have a favorable response. It's a cute slogan, it's a cute commercial, you have a favorable attitude. So hopefully then when you're in the buying situation, that favorable attitude is going to carry over to the product. That's classical conditioning. Okay, let's try and sum up what we talked about here in this segment. Many purchases and other decisions that we make are influenced in a way that the consumer is totally unaware of. We're not aware of these thoughts that, that come through that, that things are influencing us that we didn't consider. So we want to make sure that we address those issues in a very ethical manner. We want to use our research to make sure that we're being strategically effective as well as ethical. We don't want to be accused of brainwashing people or making them do things they don't want to do, which I really don't think we can do anyways. It's given us a little too much power and credit. Um, but we want to make sure that we are ethical in all our dealings. Next time we're going to talk about how the buying decisions for businesses is different than the one for consumers. Have a nice day.